Kia ora and welcome to question one of the 2012 Skull Calc exam. Uh, we're going back in time now, we're going back to some of the older exams, um, some really neat problems in these. Um, this one here is actually quite a reasonable paper. Um, okay, so first, first up we've got this um, identity that we need to prove, an algebraic identity, uh, which flows on to the next question. And then the second part, we're revolving Stewie Griffin's head around the next axis. Right. Okay, so first, um, this algebraic proof. Like any proof, start on one side and then work your way towards the other. So Left-hand side is um, a binomial that we need to cube. Uh, because of the symmetry of this question, things are going to turn out quite nicely. When we cube something like this, um, we use Pascal's triangle. So the binomial coefficients are 1, 3, 3, and 1, meaning that we get uh, this first term here cubed. And then the second thing cubed at the other end. So cube root of a plus b, all cubed is just a plus b. And then at the other end, we get a minus b. Uh, and then the middle terms, we get three lots of the first thing squared times the second thing. So three multiplied by the cube root of a plus b, all squared, multiplied by the cube root of a minus b. And likewise with the other term, we get three lots of the first term, uh, one of them and the second term, um, two of them. So need a bit more room. My bad, that should have a plus, and then this one here is squared, and the last term is a minus b. Okay, and then we can see that the um, like terms straight away, a plus b and a minus b, we get a two a, which is where we're heading on the right hand side. We're looking for a two a. We've got a factor of three, and then we've got a difference of two squares underneath a cube root. Now that's not as obvious to spot. Let's just see what we get here. We factor out the three. Um, now, we can also factor out um, a cube root of a minus b in both of them. This one's, the second term's got a squared in it, but we've also got a cube root of a plus b there twice, and in the first one, uh, the second one there once, so we can factor out one of them out of each of the terms. So cube root of a plus b gets factored out, the cube root of a minus b gets factored out, and then what else do we need in the brackets? We've, we need another cube root of a plus b, and in the other term, we need another cube root of a minus b. And then when we've got two cube roots multiplied together, it's uh, the product of two cube roots is the same as the cube root of the product. And that's where you get your difference of two squares. And then the right hand side, we've already got that factor correct. So uh, we're done. We'll just write that difference of two squares out. Proven. Or um, I guess you can write equals right hand side. And put a little box of a smiley face after it. This is my convention. Okay, how does that relate to the second part? Apparently the equation x cubed equals x plus 1 has a unique real solution, which is this giant monstrosity. Now, cubic has three solutions. They're not always going to be all real. We, um, in this case, it's a real, um, this cubic here has real coefficients, meaning that if there is complex solutions, they'll come in conjugate pairs. Um, but apparently it's got a real solution and it's um, quite a simple cubic, 
but it doesn't have a very simple solution. So how does this relate? Well, we can see here that this thing here is cubed, right? So um, it's kind of like the left left hand side of the equation we're trying to solve, something cubed. The something that we're cubing also appears here, which is kind of related to the right hand side having just an x. And we just need to see that the equation simplifies down to x cubed equals x plus one for a and b um, being particular values. So what we need to do is realize that a is equal to one half and b is equal to um, one sixth times root 23 over three. Interestingly chosen um, values. Now, the first term in the right hand side is a 2a and of course there 2a equals 1 so cool we've got that 1 and then we also need to work out what does this factor in the front equal so 3 multiplied by the cube root of a half squared minus um, 1 over 36 times 23 over 3 so if you work out what that um, thing underneath the cube root equals, you've got a half squared is a quarter minus 23 uh, over 108. Um, it comes out to be 1 over 27, and then we're cube rooting it. So the cube root of 1 over 27 is equal to um, a third, and then times by 3 we get 1. Okay, so we'd need to convince the uh, marker that we actually understand what we're doing here. So setting a equal to a half um, and b is one sixth of root 23 over 3. The right hand side, which was equal to. Um, 2a plus 3 times, actually I don't, don't even bother drawing that out again. Um, the right hand side is equal to 1 plus um, 1 times cube root of a half. No, I don't even need to write that out of it because that was our, that was the row part. Okay, the right hand side is equal to 1 plus 1 times row. And the left hand side is equal to row cubed. So therefore, row is a solution because row cubed is equal to one plus row. Okay, so we'd already proven the identity above works for all values of a and b. Um, so therefore, when we make a a half and b is equal to 1 sixth root 23 over 3, it works in the identity and it simplifies down to um, x cubed equals x plus 1 or rho cubed equals rho plus 1. Okay, Stuart Griffin's head. Um, unfortunately, I actually picked, I picked a GIF here that was quite cool. You look it up on Google, Stuart Griffin's head, GIF, and it actually, his head rotates um, <laughs> in the picture, which is it's quite disgusting actually. Um, but what we need to um, realize here is that there are two models that are chosen to model his head. One of them is an upside down parabola and the other one's a semi-ellipse. And if we rotate that curve around the x-axis, um, then we can get a volume. And if you've never seen volumes of revolution before, um, this is not the video to kind of learn that. Um, but there are plenty of videos on uh, YouTube that will teach you how to do volumes of revolution or solids of revolution. So the first thing is we need to come up with the equation. Um, we're told Stewie's width, uh, head has a width of 2w and a height of 2, 2h. So if we set the origin out to be the middle of his head, then um, we've got minus w there, w there, and h there. Okay, let's find the equations first. So first up, if it's a, a parabola,
then um, it's of the form y equals kx squared plus h vertex form and then we sub in a sub in the coordinate x equals w y equals zero uh, into that equation gives zero k x squared plus h k is minus h oh no x x shouldn't be there now x is w um, minus h over w squared so our equation y equals minus h over w squared x squared plus h okay now if we if we choose a semi ellipse for it that's definitely not semi elliptical neither is that but we'll you know we'll roll with it then the equation that you want for that is x squared over w squared the radius in the uh, x direction plus y squared over h squared the radius then the y direction equals 1 okay now we're rotating both of these um, curves around the x-axis the formula for the volume uh, in that case volume then rotate it around the x-axis is equal to pi times the integral um, of y squared dx um, the pi y squared bit comes from the fact that we have um, some some function call that y equals f of x and when we rotate it around the x-axis it generates a circle and the circle has a radius of y so the area of that circle is pi times radius squared or pi y squared and then because we're wanting volume we need to consider the thickness of that disk sometimes this is called the disk method and the thickness is dx and then if we add up um, we integrate we're adding up all of those disks from one limit on the left hand side to another limit on the right hand side okay so we can use the symmetry of Stewie Griffin's head we don't need to integrate from the far left to the far right because we can just go 2 pi and then we can integrate from x equals 0 to x equals w okay so i'm just gonna say that the volume when i rotate this section around okay i'm gonna get the volume of half his head this is actually quite satisfying and then times by two will give us the volume of the total head when rotated okay the important thing to realize is unlike finding areas where we integrate the function we're integrating the function squared that's actually quite useful for the ellipse one because there's already a y squared in the formula. There we go. But for the parabola one, we need to find y squared. Okay, so for the... Um, actually, what, asked, what was the question we asked for? The ratio of the volume obtained using a par parabolic curve to the volume obtained using a semi-elliptical curve. So when you write a ratio, you can write it as 1 to 2, like using dot dots, uh, or you can write it as a fraction. The mark schedule does it as a fraction. I'll do the same thing. So we're going to go... Ratio equals the volume of the parabola over the volume of the ellipse. Okay. The parabola one... 2 pi integral from 0 to w of y squared. Okay, y squared is that parabola equation all squared. Okay, and then underneath, again 2 pi, so those will cancel. Integral between 0 and w of the y squared for the ellipse, which needs a bit of rearranging. We've got 1 move the x squared over um, w squared term to the right hand side and times by h squared ok 
Okay, let's check that's around. Yep. Okay, and we're integrating that with respect to x as well. Okay, so let's cancel the two pi's out. Um, we can factor an h squared out of the top as well, because if if we look at that parabola one, there's an h there and an h there inside a squared, and the h squared cancels there as well. We can do that because they're constants. So now we're integrating something that's a parabola, um, a quadratic squared. You can't just use reverse chain rule and make it a three over, you know, like increase the power from a two to three because the inner function is not linear. We need to expand that before we integrate it. So we've got uh, minus x to the four, oopsies, no, we don't have a minus. Um, first thing squared is x to the 4 over w to the 4. Two lots of the middle term, be careful that's a 1 now. So we've got minus 2 over w squared x squared. And then the last term is 1 squared. So we're anti-diffing that one. Um, the bottom one's already good to go. We can anti-diff it as it is. Um, 1 anti-diffs to x. And x squared over w squared anti-diffs to x cubed over 3w squared. There we go. And we can put square brackets around that one. Okay, and then the top one, anti-diff it before I use the square brackets. x to the 5 over 5w to the 4 minus 2 over w squared x cubed over 3 plus x. Don't need a plus C when we're doing a definite integral. The denominator of the other one, uh, when we sub in, we get W minus a third of W minus uh, subbing in zero into the X's, we get zero. Okay, and now the numerator for the um, other integral, when we sub in W, we get a fifth of W um, sub in W into the second term we get minus two thirds of W and then the last term W likewise we get zeros when we um, simplify it. and then a fifth minus two thirds plus one comes out to be um, 8 fifteenths of W all divided by 2 thirds. W, the W's cancel, which is quite nice. And when we simplify that, we get 4 fifths. And does that make sense to have a ratio less than 1? Less than 1 would mean that the volume of the ellipse is bigger than the volume of the parabola. And although I did a really crummy drawing of it, it was kind of clear to see that there was a bit of a gap there between the elliptical model and the parabolic model with the elliptical model um, having more volume if you rotate it. So yes, the ratio less than one does make sense. It's actually quite a nice number. Okay, hopefully you found that video useful and we'll catch you in the next one.